Kia ora Atero. welcome to the Daily Blog Breakfast Club coming to you live from Verona Cafe on K Road. Today's agenda one, what now for the new leader of the Labour Party? Two, China visits New Zealand, how is key balancing the geopolitics? And three, did Roger Sutton think he was running the rock radio station to dissect the issues? Blogger, columnist and political commentator Chris Trotter and journalist and political commentator Selwyn Manning. Thank you for joining us. Let's get into issue one. Chris, can Andrew Little save the Labour Party? Oh, can anybody save <laughs> the Labour Party? The Labour Party is a deeply divided organisation, probably more divided now than it was even a few weeks ago because one of the most important things to take out of the result is not only that Andrew Little won, but that Grant Robertson took his level of support amongst the rank and file members of the Labour Party from 26% to 55%. That's quite considerable, now, isn't it? That's an extraordinary achievement. He's yeah. more than doubled uh, his level of support. He now has a movement within the Labour Party, whereas before he was a faction chief within the Labour caucus, now he is a faction leader across the whole of the Labour Party. Yeah. Uh, and that is a very significant shift. You've got to give it to, to Grant Robertson. He ran by far the best campaign. Yeah. Uh, he had a conference call at seven every morning during the campaign, during which strategy was discussed. He mobilised uh, young Labour um, almost to a person. Yep. They manned phone banks for him. They were ringing every person they had a phone number for. They were out in force in every meeting in their red T-shirts. Yep. Um, you know, for a new generation, handing out grants literature. I mean, this was a full court press. Yeah on the part of uh, Grant Robertson. Can they heal? Well, it depends on whether or not Grant wants it to heal. Uh, he's made the statement that he will not run again. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure whether to believe that or not. Uh, it's one thing to say, I will not seek the nomination of my party. It's quite another to say, I will not accept yes. the nomination of my party. Um, but uh, if he is willing to place himself at Grant's disposal and by implication place his 55% of the party's rank and file yeah. at Grant's disposal, then there is some hope of unity. But look, I think back to the time when I was a young tearaway in the Labour Party and our hero, Jim Anderton, had just been defeated by 55 votes, all of them cast by the Engineers Union, strangely. <laughs> Uh, party unity was the thing farthest from our minds. Right, it was right. just, we're going to get you, right. we're going to get you, we are so <laughs> going to get you. But, you know, maybe maybe today's youth are slightly more forgiving. Uh, uh, Selwyn, the attack lines by the right mm. are that Little won because of the unions and he's out of touch, he doesn't have a mandate. How does he kill that off? Oh, he's just going to do what he does. You know, he knows who he is. Like everybody knows that's been around, um, you know, uh, Andrew Little. He is comfortable in his own skin. He's comfortable in his purpose. Um, picking up on some of those areas that Chris has identified there about the party, I think this result shows that, you know, if you strip away the positions on the left, right, and start looking at things in a different way with those Labour candidates, particularly Grant Robertson and Andrew Little, you actually can see where the Labour Party's dividing line is. Mm. Now, Grant, um, Grant, he, 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 let's be frank about this. He largely represents, in my view, those who subscribe to identity politics. Yep. The other side is where Little has occupied, and that is that pragmatic aspect, but also positions itself where class is in their thinking. So you class, think the defining line is class and identity politics? I do, class and identity politics, and in some ways they do not merge. Right. They clash, they fit like that against each other. Is that a now, fair assessment? The, the, the key to this, in my view, is where is it going to be on a timeline from now? Right. Now, if you look and listen to what Chris's assessment of that was, the youth is with Grant Robertson. If yep. you accept my premise that it is a clash between identity politics and class, 
well then you would suggest that in a few years time identity politics and that side of Labour is going to be supreme. Is it generational at, at this or is, stage? It, is it class based? Well there are a whole lot of factors coming in here. Um, it is generational to a certain extent. The younger people who are there for Grant in large numbers have grown up under the neoliberal settlement. They have never known anything other than neoliberalism. Um, this makes a difference. It makes right. a very big difference if you look back at the sort of young people who were in um, Labour Youth, as it was called, yep. 20 or 30 years ago. These were very much class-oriented in terms of their politics. They were revolutionary in terms of their politics. They were the young firebrands who wanted really radical change and who the years um, would gradually um, <clears throat> take some of the heat out of a la Phil Gong. Yeah. But Labour youth, or young Labour as it now is, is a very different thing. But there is another aspect. Identity politics is what is left if you take economic stroke class politics off the table. Right. right? It's, in a sense, the safe option. Um, the problem that the identity politicians have is that the National Party is now a genuinely liberal party. Uh, it doesn't really care about these things, whereas 30, 40 years ago it, it was much more of a conservative party, socially conservative, right. particularly also economically conservative. Yeah. I, I think under that's Robert. why we see those who are advocates for identity politics actually in battle with those on the centre centre left as opposed to their true opponents perhaps right. that once were historically in the National Party. We saw that marvellous vote on, you know, for better word, the marriage equality bill yeah. in 2013 demonstrate exactly what Chris is saying here. The National doesn't have an issue with this. It's it's more pragmatic on issues of identity politics than probably some in the left. Are. Sure, sure. Um, but the clashes and the fights and the divisions are within the left and the centre left. And that's where I see the two as being incompatible. However, I do believe that the opportunity is there for someone like Andrew Little to get back to basics, yeah. to say this Labour Party under my leadership is going to be about jobs and they will mean it. Yeah. Um, and it won't necessarily be so hooked into where it's positioned on the left to the centre spectrum. Chris, how does Little navigate the minefield of factions in the Labour for his shadow cabinet? Well, he has two. <coughs> excuse me. He has two choices. The first and, and, and the most obvious and time honoured uh, is to follow the old adage about keeping your friends close but your enemies closer, uh, and therefore um, making the maximum effort to bring um, the very large faction that uh, Robertson now commands, yep. you know, close to him, surround himself with them so that uh, you know, unity becomes at least a possibility. Yep. Or he can go for the Red Wedding solution and kill all his enemies, yep. um, figuratively of course. Yes. Um, so that would mean um, making Nanaya Mahuta his deputy, that would mean making David Cunliffe uh, his finance spokesperson. Yes. Basically just a big F you right. to the people he's just defeated. Now, that would be a very gutsy call, particularly given Robertson's shifting of the ground within right. the rank and yeah. file of the party. Right. And, and also to be out of character for Little. Yes, well, he is. Let's let's be very honest here. He was the general secretary of the engineers' union, or the engineering, printing, and manufacturing yeah. union, as it's now called. That was never the most radical no. trade union no. uh, in the uh, old FOL, let alone the CTU. Mm. Uh, it, it used to ask prospective officials whether they were now or ever had been a member of the Communist Party. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, the boss of the Engineers Union is not quite the same as, you know, the, the boss of uh, Unite. our workers or Unite yeah. or there, there's you know, a, there's whatever. There's a thing in that too, that Andrew Little, has, as having been the head of the EPMU, has had and does have direct relationships with the mainstream media yeah. that others that may have come through from the union movement do not have. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention very, very strong relationships with many CEOs in New Zealand yes. or former CEOs. Yeah. Yes. And certainly yes. relationships with large corporations. Why I say that about the media is because as we know, the EPMU 
represents many journalists in the mainstream mm -hmm. corporate sector. Yep. Yep. And so that does God make a difference. God knows why. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it comes in somewhere in the printing area and down. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. That that is is down. Yes, printing. Yes, printing. Yeah, yeah, journalists. Yeah, journalists. Oh, yes. Fair enough. Sal, Sal, what are the big policy challenges for Labour now? Yeah. Oh, once again, it's got to get rid of some of the stuff that didn't work. It, 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 I do think it needs to take a pragmatic stance here. I think yep. it's got to be true to where it is. Labour, I think, needs to anchor itself on that left-right spectrum, centre to centre-left, and not try and be the, a far-left party. Yep. I, yep. I do yep. believe yep. that that's where it needs to be. I think yep. Andrew needs to borrow um, uh, Mao Zedong's famous uh, invitation to letter uh, a hundred flowers bloom, a thousand schools of thought contend. He needs to actually open the debate up. And I think the solution for Labour is to give itself much more room uh, to let a lot of debates take place around things like universal basic income. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. They had a policy going into the last election about a, a major Royal Commission of Inquiry into the workplace. Yep. Um, I think that needs to be developed. I think Labour's Labour's best option, rather than you know, aggregate a whole lot of very specific and and quite difficult policies like capital gains tax, mm. um, like raising the age of eligibility, um, is to actually say to New Zealand, we really need to have a stock take. We've had 30 years of neoliberalism; it hasn't produced yeah. the sort of society that was promised. Yeah, where not going to tell you because it simply wouldn't be true that we have all the answers. We well, want to know yeah. what you think. So, so let's pick yeah. up on that. We will not be telling you. I think it's about relevancy out there in the political landscape. Yeah. So Labour does need now to realise that there is an honour and a purpose in being in opposition. Yeah. That it has to be a representative of the people, the communities, the electorates, the constituencies. And it needs to make sure that when someone is not getting that hip replacement, that I or some other operation, that they are there to make sure that happens right. when it's rightfully there. Yep. They are there too that when someone at school is not getting their fair share of education, that they make sure that happens. And also to look at the national-led government and where it demonstrates fiscal imprudence, yeah. that Labour exposes that and comes up with solutions that gel with the Greens and other parties in its camp. Now that is where the relevancy comes in. I felt that it was going in to the last election irrelevant yeah. from the main bulk of the population. That's right, and also with a kind of top-down approach. We yeah. know what's best. I think you know there are two things that it really has to try and promote. The, f the first is that the game is rigged. Mm. The whole game is now rigged. Particularly I mean, this, in the communication yeah, to the this public is, areas. This is what Elizabeth Warren, um, you know, the, the left-wing Democrat in yeah. the States, is saying to her audiences, and it's getting a huge response because what she says gels with what people are feeling, that we cannot get ahead, we cannot buy a house, because somehow all the rules have been rewritten so that, you know, we can't do this. So the, the Labour Party has to make that case yeah. and then the second thing it has to do it, it has to in making that case break down the idea that all politicians are the same that they'll all tell you what they're going yeah. to do to you yeah. um, that uh, you know you cannot trust them what Labour has to say is yes we know the game is rigged but we believe the answers lie with you and, and the, other thing, the, other to thing, the other thing too what is, we need to know is that labor is in essence a party whose members in parliament represent those communities it is different from the greens that are there as party list based parties yeah, and yeah, it needs yeah. to advance the differences amongst its own blocks so it's relevant in that F area. final question uh will little still be the leader come 2017 yes or no <laughs> I simply don't know. It depends how much goodwill there is um, on behalf of Robertson and his people. Uh, it depends whether the news media is willing to give him anything remotely like a fair go. There are so many imponderables. I yes, hope he is. 
I hope he is. There are so many variables. I think within the Labour Party, there is a look on the faces of those who lost that realise that there is a want um, to stick with what they get yeah. for quite a time. But like Chris says, those other variables can destroy ambition and reality very quickly. Let's move on to issue two. China visits New Zealand. Should we be welcoming our new economic overlords? Or should we be protesting the largest totalitarian communist regime in the world? Selwyn, what does China make of the TPPA? Well, China is obviously not in the TPPA. It has its own version of which it's seducing New Zealand to be a yep. Western-leaning country that is advocating its own interests. New Zealand seems to be re you know, re reflecting on that yep. and certainly is not resisting that. Um, so that's an interesting thing. The other bloc in opposition to the TPPA clearly is those BRIC countries, the Brazil, the, um, the, the, the Republic of, of, of South Africa, India and um, China, of course. Mm. So the countries are realising and realised some time ago, at least two years ago, that they were being shoved out of the camp by the United States and they would have an alternative to that. Now, as far as the TPPA is concerned, you are seeing the emphasis and the, the, um, the positions, if you like, um, of, of China and its bilateral relationship. So, meaning its relationship with New Zealand, its free trade relationship with New Zealand, being elevated up to significance. You know, when, when it's just signed this with Australia, right, the, the, the FTA with Australia, just coming out of the G20, the leader of the biggest nation on earth comes to New Zealand and tries to actually present as an equal footing yeah. with us. Why is that so? Um, and I think it all comes down, and I'll just put on my reading glasses because there's this fascinating little thing in the huge joint statements that came out last night. And it's from the, 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 um, the, the, the leader of um, the People's Republic saying, to advance our common interest and work with the international community to uphold the regional and global peace and stability. End of quote. Now what he's talking about there is he is saying to New Zealand, you may be very much in the security, defence, intelligence areas with the United States, and you may think it's okay to be solely in the trade areas with the People's Republic, but we're saying we have a way of working with our friends. We consider you a friend, we're demonstrating that you're a friend, and we expect you to act in a friendly manner on security, intelligence, and defence with us as well. Uh, Chris, should New Zealand be suspicious of China's interest? <laughs> It's a little late <laughs> to have second thoughts. Right. They're our largest trading partner. Uh, and following on um, from, from Selwyn's you know, exposition of the geopolitical situation, uh, you know, the weird schizophrenic, if I may use that term, foreign policy of both um, New Zealand and Australia you know, has a limited lifespan. Right. Um, right. The Chinese, by dint of their enormous economic power, their growing economic power, um, uh, are gently at the moment, uh, and probably for you know the next 10, 20 years, suggesting that a different modus vivendi needs to be hammered out uh, between the English-speaking powers of this particular part of the world, Australasia, the mm. Pacific, um, the People's Republic, and the United States of America. Because this idea that you can reach out to you know, the Pacific fleet and reach out to Beijing um, uh, with, with your, you know, with uh, your left foot. That's right, with your, with your milk powder in your hand. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just not viable in the long term, particularly when the United States is aggressively reasserting yes. uh, its geopolitical presence in the Asia-Pacific region. So what's significant here is New Zealand is a hair's breadth away from signing an alliance with the United States to return to some sort of, you know, that, 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 that the Washington Declaration. Yep. That does not forward commit us to United States conflicts. Yeah. But an alliance. Well, it would, and it's that far away from that. Uh, and that's where China was most sensitive. This move from China is, is very much a smooth operator that knows its purpose in the Asia-Pacific region and the globe, and is moving with a lot, of, a lot of respect, a particular piece on the chessboard and saying, I'm sure your diplomats will realise what we're saying here. Selwyn, are our five eyes spying on the Chinese delegation right now? 
Um, well, they're spying on everybody, including their friends, like the Germans and everybody else. And one would imagine that you know anything without a tinfoil hat on was getting spied on at the G20 in Brisbane. I think it's only uh, fair to say though that the Chinese will be doing this. <laughs> so everyone's uh, spying on. We, we, we live yeah, in, in a, terms of, of uh, we live in an open communication cy society. cyber attacks. Yeah, you know, China's yeah. right up there at the top. Uh, Chris, what's the long-term goal here for China? Our long-term goal for the Chinese is what it has always been, and they are one of the oldest civilizations on the face of the planet, and that is that the peoples of the world should respect the Celestial Kingdom, also known as the People's Republic, that uh, its, uh, its resources should remain unmolested by enemies, uh, and uh, that if it so desires, um, it should be able to make its way in the world without let or hindrance. That is China's long-term goal. It's always been China's long-term goal. We are in one of those rare periods when China is in an expensive mode. I mean, Cheng Ho took his great fleet all the way to East Africa. If he had wanted to, he could have sailed in the other direction and discovered the uh, Americas, or he could have sailed round Africa and settled over Europe with 20,000 men and 600 foot long um, ocean going junks. But China didn't do that. But China now recognizes Zhang Ho as a, uh, as a hero and it is in one of its expensive modes. And, and, but China's own diplomats would say they respect and they expect others to respect the need for China to maintain security around its shipping lines and that's where its expansive mode is as opposed to taking over other countries. And that, that's an interesting kind of position. That Third is. issue today, Roger Sutton's surprise resignation from Sarah following sexual harassment complaints and the hash made of it by the State Services Commission. Chris, how badly has Ian Rennie handled this? Ian Rennie should tender his resignation. Really? That's what he should do. There is no way that the man can defend what the State Services Commission, let alone the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, um, lent its considerable mana to in Christchurch the other day. Uh, when, having just signed a confidentiality agreement, um, Mr Sutton stood up and, and gave his side of the story. I just called a few girls, sweetie, and uh, I might have given one or two of them a hug. I mean, can't, can't guy do anything anymore. Terrible. Yes, yeah, yes. You know, and, and, and the rest, as, as Toby Manhire so beautifully yes. put it in, in, the in, in the Herald on, on, on Friday Marvelous. morning, you know, <laughs> it's like middle aged blokes all over New Zealand let out this great whale of protest. Well, tough guys. Yeah, yeah. You know, just yeah. wake up. Uh, Selwyn, visible G string Fridays, who do you like to have sex with and full body hugs? It sounds like an episode of The Office. Not a government department handling the rebuild of a city. Yeah. I mean, surely the people of Christchurch will be very angry with this. Well, one would imagine so, and certainly the press seems to be. You know, I think many in Christchurch are divided. He's the supposed saviour, someone who's been doing the good stuff for Christchurch that so we don't see up in Auckland. Yeah. Yet. Um, and they're saying, oh dear, you know, we, we can't actually tolerate this kind of behaviour, even from the Adonis that has been in this position at Sierra. So, I, I, you know, where do you, where do you go with that? I, I think. You know, like what Chris is saying here, you know, this, this weirdness coming out of the State Service Commission, the DPMC, etc. It's like the old boys club didn't actually know how to deal with one of their brightest and best looking. Yeah. But those questions that you put, you know, about the G-string Fridays, etc. I've never been asked to wear a G-string on a Friday. I'm sure Chris hasn't. I doubt <laughs> if you have to. The world so there is, is not ready for that. There is an advanced... <laughs> culture of sexism yeah, that was in yeah, display there yeah. and thank goodness that somebody said enough is enough I don't go to work to be treated like this this is ridiculous it's, it's only a small part away from saying okay we want um, you know people that aren't white to start wearing a particular makeup and singing you know some sort of yeah, thing yeah. On, on Friday nights it's just an insult and to come from our public sector I think Chris is right you know, if, if, if those wrapped around the Prime Minister haven't picked up the, even John Key's words to Ian Rennie about, you know, it was blindingly obvious, blah, yeah. blah, blah, well yeah. then, you know, that, that's a signal. Those that were hardly words of encouragement no. or support from the Prime Minister. No. And a Prime no. Minister no. was a very powerful. chilly wind around yes, my neck about yes, the stage yes, of yes. Ian Rennie. Uh, we're going to wrap the show. Uh, final word, Chris. 
Oh, uh, just, uh, I, I guess, a, a sense of, um, I don't know, it was a very bleak few weeks following the general election uh, for people on the left in New Zealand politics. I think, I think the choice of Andrew Little um, was a bold one um, by the Labour Party. Uh, we've discussed, you know, the narrowness of it and, and what it could mean in terms of different directions. But, you know, if the left has any ambitions at all to once again play a significant role in New Zealand society, I would say this is their last chance. So in your final word? I'll have to create that chance. Yeah. Um, yes, well, I, I think, you know, people are starting to think about Christmas at the moment. What are they going to buy people? Think of poor old John Key. I think they, people should start to look around the bookshops, what's left of the bookshops, you know, uh, and, and look for, if there are any, Michael King's books on the history of New Zealand. Uh, yeah, well, apparently. Um, and, apparently, you know, yeah. I say that because of this amazing quote from our wonderful Prime Minister, John Key, on Māori Pākehā relations, particularly going back to the formation periods in this country, and quote John Key here, in my view, New Zealand was one of the very few countries in the world that was settled peacefully, end of quote. Now thankfully there are those that have taken exception to that. I think our Prime Minister needs an education. Yes. So if there is anything to be spent well this Christmas, perhaps it's a good book from the late Michael King for our Prime Minister John Key. We'll see you next week. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Cheers. <laughs>